All right, welcome to the Constructs Podcast, where we explore software issues based on actual recent Constructs engagements. Uh, today we deal with a recent engagement that represents something that every one of you that has been utilizing a Scrum methodology encountered uh, once in your life, and that is your first Scrum introduction. In the studio for a return visit today is Earl Beatty. Uh, some of you astute listeners will remember Earl from the podcast we did concerning scaling Agile, kind of the other extreme from what we're going to talk about today. Uh, to refresh your memory, Earl is a senior fellow here at Construct Software. He's designed and implemented and improved software practices for companies and industries, including telecom, computer hardware and software, pharma, medical devices, oil and gas, retail, and many others. At Constructs, Earl designs and leads seminars and provides consulting services on agile methods, early project lifecycle practices, estimation requirements, QA, and software methodologies. His innovation and initiative is one of the driving forces behind the Constructs on-demand e-learning content. And he is a tireless consumer and critic of my homebrew beer, which we don't have in front of us. We don't, but you know, it's too I, I try more. to help out any way I can. So welcome back, Earl. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, so let's talk about this recent engagement, uh, just to set it up a bit. Okay. A relatively young startup, you know, doing some fun stuff, looking to be one of the cool kids, wants to go agile, um, foosball, free snacks, work any 12 hours a day you want. You know, the whole yada, yada, startup kind of mentality. Uh, a smaller team that was effectively just responding to the usual fire hose of tickets. That was kind of their life cycle model, effectively, which is not unusual, I think, for most, for a lot of young startups. They sort of have tribal ways of doing their it's business. It's not unusual for a lot of companies, period. <laughs> I, I mean, that's the most common thing I see when I walk into a shop. Even if they say they've been doing Scrum for a couple of years, I, basically, they're just running a ticketing process in a two-week increment. Right. So so the ticket is God for a lot of organizations. Interesting. Really interesting. So, yeah. you know, no formal process per se, but they they had an, a desire to want to do some planning and plan work as opposed to this ad hoc uh, responsive work that was basically the ticket inbound stuff. So tell me, you know, we, we normally when we do these engagements, we have um, to use a sports analogy, we do a pregame call with the sponsors to kind of get a feel for ground state, get a feel for the participants in the classroom, get a feel for some things going on there. And so, you know, what did you discuss with the, the sponsor in this particular case as far as goals um, before you arrived? Right. So there was a, a couple things, and, and it was very similar to some other clients I dealt with recently, is one thing they really wanted to do was to try to get a common language and a common understanding across the entire team. So they had a couple of people that had done it before on the team, uh, uh, and this was particularly unusual, too, because they had some people that was some really deep experience about the foundations way back when. And they had a lot of people that could hardly spell the word. And so they just wanted to make sure that there was a common understanding. The other goal was really to try to help out uh, the backlog, right? They, 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 they knew they were going to have a backlog. They were just like, how do you create this thing? What's in it? How do you manage it? How do you deal with it? So there was a lot of stuff around the backlog as well. So again, this commonality overall in the backlog and dealing with some of the quality issues they were seeing. So what, how did they, in a non-Scrum environment, what, what was their method, methodology for, for, for building and maintaining the backlog? Is just a spreadsheet or, or no, they, they clipboard had a, or something like that? They had a, a, this particular company <laughs> had a homegrown ticketing system where you create an object and you can assign it to a person and it has states and that kind of stuff. But one of the things that, that the way they populate the ticketing system and a lot of these companies is that they populate the ticketing system by hey, we have a JavaScript job, we'll create a ticket for that. We have a backend data structuring job, we'll create a ticket for that. And so basically they've taken the design and, and then populate that design in sort of tickets that people have to build out the details of that and then bring it back together. Okay. So that was their methodology, was assign tickets, try to coordinate that, make their building something interesting, and hopefully when they're all done, it comes together to something useful. So when, when you look at an organization like that, that, it, that has, so they have multiple work streams they're playing with, right? I mean, you in a sense, each, each, each area of the architecture sort of has its own little stream of work that right. you try to coordinate right. to come together, yeah. So people get tickets, they start working on these tickets. There, there's, there's a lot of parallelism to that because you just keep assigning them out to the engineers. To you get highly so, effective in terms of use yeah, of people. Right. But, but, you know, one of the big mental shifts that we talk about, I think, in, in terms of Scrum is the fact that 
that you start thinking in terms of a team as opposed to individuals who are performing tasks in little, little spaces, right? So um, I think you and I have talked about this not only with this particular client, but other clients where the, one of the big mental shifts of getting people to, to move into, a, into an agile environment or a scrum environment is just thinking about the notion of the team concept, right? And, and um, team activities, uh, shifting in the, in the behavior and understanding of how that really is the dynamic now for measurement as opposed to the individual mm-hmm. performance. And, and so what sort of things do you use to, to, to illustrate that and make people feel like this is going to be a good thing and it's not a significant change to how they're actually going to be, at the end of the day, they're still going to be doing some of these tickets, but the, the concept is now a team environment to, to do something more a team role. How does that work? Right. So one of the uh, ways we approach it, I approach it initially is to help them start separating the idea of throughput from being busy, right? How much software are you delivering that's usable to the consumer? And that's the way you start to break into this idea of being a team as opposed to a bunch of parallel streams. Parallel streams, you're very busy, you're working very hard, you're moving things through, but are you delivering stuff? Are you delivering potential stuff that somehow if it gets merged together and tested right, it will actually work rather than saying, hey, we got good stuff on a regular basis. So the idea of throughput versus activity. But for as far as thinking about teams, first of all, you end up often in the sports analogies, right? Right, right. Sure. Because the, the team sports where people have sort of designated roles, but together they produce something kind of interesting. I often use the illustration between offensive professional basketball in the U.S. and maybe college or even high school basketball offense in the U.S. Because on the professional basketball in the U.S., what you see happen is much like the stream process. While five people may run down the floor, four of them stand on the edges and let the star do all these moves, whoever Showtime. it is. Showtime. And then does the fake of it. Right. And then maybe right. they collapse in the basket to, <laughs> to collapse. Away. Whereas in you know smaller colleges and high schools, when the, all five people run down, They pass the ball and they set these plays that they've memorized and they all handle the ball and they all work it around and finally someone takes a shot. But if they take a shot too soon, usually they get benched because they're not playing as a team. They're starting to switch back to being an individual. Right. Right. So so I got to be careful, though, the sports metaphors. You go to some places, I have to use cricket. Yeah. So the bowler is there, true, but the, true. But the, but the, the batsman. The demographic of your, yeah. of your right. analogy has You'll to use change. Cricket, yeah. you know, go to Australia. I'm going to be using rugby, which is actually where Scrum, Scrum. comes from. Sure. Comes from the the rugby movement where the team works together and actually does work while they're moving forward, as opposed to just chatting with each other and saying, "What are you doing today?" Right. Right. So the sports metaphors. Um, the other thing I, I try to do to help them understand the idea of a team is is just idea that you do not have to be good at everything, but you have to be willing to help out on anything. And that's a that's kind of hard because they're just saying, I, I, I'm really good at one thing, but I'm not really good at everything. So how do I do this? How does this work? And that's often is a whole nother line of discussion. Sure. I mean, you know, in many organizations, everybody's off in their own little worlds, you know, just, just kind of playing in those little silos, if you will, and maybe not used to being outside of the silos. So they want to, I imagine one of the team thoughts here that might be, might have been aired in the class was, was, you know, how do we weave these silos together? Um, Do we have to become generalists on the team or can we keep our own particular specialty as something that's valuable to the, to the greater efforts? How do you, you know, is that a common fear you've heard, you know, in talking to other folks? Yeah. So I, I actually don't hear the word silos much, okay. on, especially in a small organization. Silos seems to be a big company problem yeah, more than a yeah. small company problem. They're just small little cups. Yeah. So, but uh, <laughs> my discipline, my specialty, you use the word specialty. I hear that more frequently than silo. Okay. Uh, the things I know, this is what I was hired to do. I was hired as a JavaScript programmer. I was hired as a UX person. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hear that a lot. Um, and... This is one of the things that has really, I think, shifted a bit since early Agile days. In the 2000s, late 90s, 2000s, maybe the early aughts. I love that, that word, aughts. The aughts. The, the, aughts. aughts. the early Just aughts. Never, we didn't figure out anything for the teens, did we? Never, Just, I think the teens work. Works. Teens, really? Yeah. 20s sounds cool now, though. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you're old enough to remember it almost. Shut um. up. Wow. <laughs> wow. Are we done? We're done. Are we? yeah. Go ahead. Keep right. going. So... Um, <laughs> The uh, the Roaring Twenties. Uh, so 
But the idea that they have to be early scrum thought, you know, we want these idea of generalists. We want everyone to have pretty good, decent skills in all places and be able to take up any part of the work to make it happen. And, and that just doesn't fit with human nature. And, and it was not really long embraced by any actual development teams out there in the real world. I mean, it could it could happen. It's a wonderful thing if it does, but mm-hmm. it's not what seems to happen in the real world. So we still have our specialties, right? People says, I'm really good at C++ or I'm really good at .NET or whatever it is I'm really good at. The trick here is, is that stepping out and say, yes, I have my specialty, but am I willing to help out someone else? Um, one of the things, the example I like to use is say that I'm the JavaScript person and a ticket comes in or a story comes in that's really, really heavy with JavaScript. Well, during any kind of planning or preparation, I'm going to be taking the lead on that because I'm the smartest person on that. But I need to bring the rest of the team with me. I can't just go alone because I'm going back to parallel development again. I'm not looking at throughput. I'm just trying to stay busy myself. So I need to go in there and I need to break that apart, that JavaScript problem apart and tease apart and find out what little bits that someone else who knows C++ said, if I show you this, you have enough programming basic knowledge that you can do that part. Well, I'm still working on this kind of thing over mm-hmm. here, right? So, so there's a bit of risk management associated with that as well, right? If the team gets to, to do that on a regular basis and they begin to say, you know, even doing a slight decomposition of a task and say that, I, you know, I want to have somebody else pick this up because I have other things in my queue that are that I need to work on, but this person could pick that up. It, it's a way of leveling risk, I would say, right? It, well, it levels risk from a couple of ways. One, you're looking at more throughput. You have less work in progress or work in process, whatever that is. <clears throat> right. Whatever word you like, progress or process. And the idea is that you've got a whole lot of things started, but nothing finished. Right. So by having someone else help out, you help finish things more quickly, which lowers risk that way. You also uh, lower the uh, uh, risk that if that JavaScript person leaves the company for some reason, that no one else knows what the heck's going on because they've had to bring the team along with them a little bit. And those other people have to be willing to say, you know, that's not my specialty, but I can see that little part I can do here that can help you get that bit done. And as they keep doing that sprint after sprint after sprint, they start to go, hey, you know, I'm not a specialist here, but I understand it now. If you were to get hit by a truck, we could make sense of it. We wouldn't be totally stuck while we go out and get another JavaScript specialist. Right, right. And when that specialist comes on, I can kind of explain what was going on here because it's not totally foreign, which is another risk. How do you onboard somebody and they look at someone else's code and they go, well, that's all garbage. Not because it's necessarily garbage. It could be, but because they just understand the framework, the thinking behind it. And if this person brought the team along, the team could explain the thinking behind it. And they go, oh, okay, I see what they're trying to accomplish here. Now I know why. I know I can move it forward. Sure, sure. So that lowers that onboarding risk as well. So this this brings us to the quiz portion of our podcast for this week. Um, Recall that last podcast with Steve McConnell on, on More Effective Agile, we talked about this key principle of increasing team capacity by building individual capacity, kind of a little bit what you're talking about. And there's he mentions this thing called role density, right? Which, um, to refresh my memory on that, role density, you know, my, my memory is like two beers long, you know, and, and, and it's it's early in the day, so it's even, it's even right. it's actually as, as, as good as it's going to be right now, but you might as well dig into it because I'll remember it now, so. Role yeah. density. Role density. Well, uh, this is, uh, uh, it used to be, uh, other people called it T-shaped developers okay. kind of thing. Um, but the idea of role density is, is how many roles, well, he, the way he puts it in his book is how many roles can I take on? Can I be a JavaScript a person and a .NET things. person sure. and a sure. firmware assembly person? How many roles can take on? And, and in, in, in the book, uh, he has sort of these Venn diagrams where we have low role density, none of the circles of specialties overlap, and with higher role density, some overlap occurs. Not massive overlap, but some overlap. Right. I, I think role density as a concept is interesting. Um, I don't see it happening necessarily as a ongoing activity in most organizations in the sense of we want to build role density. I think it's a happy it's accident. A natural, it naturally occurs. If you have, if you're playing as a team. Gotcha. But a lot of, a lot of my, even my more seasoned scrum organizations still do not want to play as a team. They want to break their tickets down by architectural components, assign those tickets to individuals at the beginning of the sprint, and then at the end of the sprint say, how are you doing? 
And so things like the stand-up become stupid and everyone hates them. <laughs> Sprint planning is stupid and everyone hates it. Retrospectives, why am I bothering with this? And so they quickly just sort of go back to a two-week the- incremental okay. ticketing process, yeah. which, don't get me wrong, two-week incremental process is still better than three-month incremental process. Right. Right. So in two weeks, you still hopefully are making progress and you get more visibility and all that kind sure, of good stuff. Sure. But they just slide back because... No one help them understand what it means to be a team and act, act as a team and think as a team. Because here's, here's the real crutch, right? Where do you want to do your heavy thinking? This is one of the things that Agile people really got out of someone like Fred Brooks. Where do you want to do your heavy thinking? Because wherever you want to do your heavy thinking, you want to put multiple brains on it. And this is one of the biggest difference between XP and Scrum. XP said, you know what? We want to do heavy thinking while we're coding. And that's why XP promoted its pair programming so strong, because we want to have at least two brains whenever we're doing this hard thinking. Scrum, on the other hand, said, we want to do our heavy thinking during design. And that's why they wanted to have the sprint planning meeting where we got into every story and broke it all down in these little, small, little plan elements, often called tasks. Because we want to be able to say, ah, we as a group got together and figured this out. And so when we go into the sprint, it's just typing crap in. We don't have to think anymore. Right. We do our heavy thinking as a team, we do, when we go to individual do work, we're just like, because there's, I already did the hard work. And that's what allows, and that, that's what allows to bring those other people in. Because if you did the hard work as a team, those little things are just small executables that everyone already understands because we already did the hard part. Right, right. You converge outside. Right. right. As opposed to giving you a ticket as an individual and says, figure this out. And you spend half a sprint just trying to figure out and do the hard work by yourself. Right. So a lot of eyes on a problem, too, in that case, it helps because you have multiple viewpoints on on the perception of what a, re, what a solution is for that, right? It, absolutely. And when that smart person, my JavaScript person I've been using, gets sort of stuck, often it's a question from somebody else or a test that maybe the QA person is going to say, you know what, if I test it this way, and they're going to go, oh, I see what's going to happen. And then they start revising it on the spot, right? And so it gets them past this I'm going to go sit by myself for six hours and just deep think it or sub think it, right. right, as I do other tasks. And it helps that dynamic of flow and exchange. And we see through lots of studies that that group design effort actually improves design. Now, it still needs that one person to sort of hold it all together. This is something that Fred Brooks put out, Fred Brooks put out in his most recent book, The Design of Design, which I think came out like three years ago. Hmm. Okay. But it's you still designed to have it hold together whatever level of abstraction you're at. You need one brain to really grasp that level of abstraction. But that doesn't mean that that person works alone, that they can have lots of people assisting them, asking them questions. Well, so you're always going to have right. this person who's going to be sort of the lead on any one thing because they're going to be the smartest person. They're going to be one holding the whole concept, but they got to bring the rest of that team in and participate in that. So the team says, yeah, I kind of get it. I see how what you're doing here. And we can execute on pieces of this because we already did the hard work of figuring out how to solve it. Sure. So in the case of the startup, and in this particular case, it's it's a little easier because perhaps they're, they're might be a little more malleable at this stage. You know, they're, they're more malleable. They're, they're small enough that they sponges, can sort of sit together. You know, yeah. Okay. Right. Though well, they did have outsourced contract workers too that they're going to have to try to farm things on. Oh, okay. And that's one of the, the more difficult <clears throat> parts of this team aspect of Scrum is that it really, really Scrum really needs this tight communication pattern. And when you start distributing yourself, right, one of the mistakes, and this I just saw the mistake on a really large multinational company doing it too, same mistake is that, oh, we will use our ticketing system as our communication vehicle. And so if I just type it in the ticket and then hit commit, it will then ping up whoever's responsible and they can pick up the ticket and work on it without ever having a conversation with me. And the ticketing system cannot handle that, especially the ones built on user story formatting with description and, or acceptance criteria description that was never designed to carry enough content. It was supposed to be an aid an to a conversation. Loop, an open loop request, effectively. Right? Yeah. That you, 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 the implicit feedback loop was never really there. Well, not just the feedback loop, but it was like saying, this is like, uh, this is like taking post-it notes and you're placing around Places like, oh, I need to do this task. It isn't the task. It is something to remind you that you should do this stuff. And so the ticket in Jira, that's model and use story, should be enough to say, oh, the product, oh, I need to talk to the team about this and help them understand this. And we'll just use this as a visual aid to help move the work through as I'm having this ongoing conversation with the team, (laughs) as opposed to the ticket is the work. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that makes total sense. So, so you know, on this on this topic of the generalist versus specialist kind of thing, you you, you, you have to guess tread a fine line about how much how much you have to have people do lots of tasks versus ones that that a scenario where someone would say, you know, a few things that I could pick up here would help me as a team member, as opposed to being everybody having the ability to do everything. So that's the kind of the, you have to walk a line there, I guess, in terms of, of that self initiative to say, you know, I can help on that task. If you give me a little bit of information, I can be a better team player for for part of that. You know, if you're writing your user stories, well, what I see over and over again, when I was organization, I get them, write them well, is that for my, Cody developer type specialists, they almost never work on anyone else's specialty, right? Because you've got to slice all through the architecture to build something useful. It's not like you just got a pure JavaScript ticket. That's where you get in trouble. But you have a ticket that requires some JavaScript, some SQL writing, some transports. And, you know, and so everyone in those specialists is actually doing the work, the little bit of work necessary to get that ticket done. Mm-hmm. Where they tend to have to step out of their role and help out someone else is the testing. Yeah, yeah. Right. The tester is right. writing these tests, but now they've gotten all the code together. And now it's time to execute all these tests. Well, we've got still one tester, but we got 35, 40 tests to write and help automate and get into the automation system like that. That's where my JavaScript person, my SQL person all get together and they start putting totally. stuff into the testing system and then running the test that the tester wrote. Right. That's where I see the helping out others almost all the time. I mean, I almost never see the tester writing C++. I mean, they're like, what if the tester is going to write C++? Like, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> that tester is too damn busy already to take up your work. Oh. But what's going to happen is you as a developer are going to go over and help that tester. Yeah. Right. And because that's what it needs to get this one story done to move on to the next story that's the next most important thing to work on. Right. Absolutely. So, so you know, you work with this team, you get them started. I'm sure there's an inevitable question here that you know and it brings up this idea of this, this the famous j curve right the, the original economic thing about comp- about about countries I call, changing. I call the hype disillusionment curve All right exactly <laughs> yeah well that's another way that's a pejorative way of describing it yeah but but you know it's it's basically a, uh, it describes the team performance under a change situation right we're, we're the, deci- the team decides to do something different productivity is going to drop for a while and you know, we as practitioners here at Constructs, our job is to make sure that that drop is as short as possible in time, and you want to get them back up the other side of the curve, and then have that performance actually improve because they've made something different. So, you know, I'm sure that you get the questions from management, and particularly in, in in startups, like how long is it going to take for these people to get proficient? How long is it going to take for these people to be productive again? You know, and and obviously business pressures on a startup to continue to justify their existence and make money and get new clients and things. There's a tendency to want to try and drive things harder, but that's not a good thing necessarily in this case. So how do you, what expectations do you set with management about once you've come and gone working with a a new startup? What what do they expect? What what should they see the team doing? What's a reasonable settle out, settle out time? Right, so I, I give them a couple pieces of advice about that J curve settle out time. Uh, one piece of advice is is try not to go from where you are today to fully scrum. Um, I just see that thing as like the light switch detect, or just we're gonna we're gonna become scrum tomorrow. Right. As as no, you're not because the J curve. You're gonna flounder there, and what's gonna happen is gonna be so overwhelming that you're gonna go back to what you know to do because you need to ship something, and you're gonna abandon it. So I say, see, so what I tell people is I say, I don't want you doing Scrum. I want you using Scrum. I want you to use Scrum as the goalpost, the long-term goal, and say, what step are we going to make next time? What step are we going to do after that? What step are we going to do that to take us toward that goal rather than just sort of leapfrog and say, we're there, right? Even in this new company, I said, you guys got still a couple years or three years now of doing things a certain way. Try and turn that off and do something else tomorrow. People right, don't know to talk right. to, what to get things done. So that's going to deepen the curve and make it longer. The second thing I let them know is that I think the J curve, in my experience, takes about three to five cycles, whatever you're doing, to get through. So so two week sprints or, or? If, if, if you're trying to learn something about how to do sprints, it's going to be three to five sprints. If you're trying to learn how to do a good release, three to five releases. Okay. And this is one of the problems that we had back in larger projects where we say, hey, we want to learn how to do projects better. And the projects were taking a year. Right. 
three to five cycles a year. No one even the team is half changed no, by then, no, right? Let alone learn anything from that. And so we never learned anything from that. Right. Here's where Agile does give us a strong advantage that we can shorten the cycle time on certain things. Like how do we actually run a sprint well? How do we do a stand up well? Well, three to five cycles of that. Right. Two or three or five sprints, then we learn the sprint process. But that drives things. home the idea of the retrospective being an important aspect of converging and 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 and, and getting up that curve. Is that you the team needs to ask the question, all right, we crawled across broken glass on those last sprints. We don't want to do that again. What, what do we want to change as a team moving forward to make sure that we don't do that again? Right. Right? And, and then not become things, overwhelmed right? by it. Take one thing at a time. Pick yeah. away at it. Yeah. Right? Pick away because at it. otherwise you're just like, oh, this is too much work. Right? And this is one of the things I'm about to go in with another client um, in Europe. And they're wanting to rewrite an entire medical device software thing. And, and one of the things I'm going to say is, you know what, you don't want to like throw out the old ones just this right the new one because you'll never get done. That one took 10 years to get to where it was. You're not going to, to settle down and everything else. Yeah. Can we take the existing one and then change one thing about it? Then change another thing about it. And change it. So we always have a working thing and maybe we don't release it, but replacing it piece by piece so we can do all the testing, all the integration because it still works as opposed to nothing works, nothing works, nothing works and finally something works. So can we wrap it and move it slowly? Yes, yeah, it's going to be ugly, right. piecemeal garbage in the meantime, but it always can allow us to have validation and verification going on as we see fit. Awesome. So two more topics for today. One, one is um, a common argument, I think, that has that existed for a long time, and I think newbies probably fall for this idea that in um, traditional software practices versus Agile, this notion of design that, that people, I think... Um, mistakenly think there's no no need for design anymore in Agile because you just do it on the fly kind of stuff, right? And and that's a misconception, right? I mean, there, there are other aspects of how design gets done in Scrum, so it still actually gets done, but it's not like big D design. Right? Well, so one, there's a couple ways to think about this. One is that the idea of upfront design documents is pretty well gone in Scrum. Right. Uh, that is right. that we're going to create a large document that documents design. Um, there's nothing that says that you can't document as built design. This is one of the things that's really important for my regulated organizations is that we go through the design process that Scrum has built in. And then after we build it, we document the design that was built. And then we keep updating it every time we do mm -hmm. another sprint. So the as built design really gets around a lot of problems of previous design documents because we did this to be or speculative design. Then we actually got in there and did the work and realized, holy crap, does it work like we thought it was going to? And we made changes, but we never really updated that thing because it was already behind, too late, it was too expensive. And then future people would never trust it because it never reflected what was actually built. Right. But if we did as built documentation, then future maintainers can have faith in it because it always reflects what was built because that was part of building it was updating the small update to change the as built documentation reflect what was actually built. Right. So there's so we could still do that, but <clears throat> One of the things that <clears throat> in the abandonment of, of upfront design or big design with a big D is that they haven't really grasped this nature of, first of all, architectural layers or, or abstraction layers, because there are layers of decisions that have to be made to enable a team to actually build it. Like what languages we're going to use? Right. 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 What technologies do we want to try to put in here that actually gives us an advantage on our product that we can sell it for a premium? Someone has to make those layers of decisions ahead of time, regardless of no design up front. So there's layers of, of decisions that have to be made before the team even kicks off. And that's going to be made decision, and Scrum doesn't really talk about that. Right. But then once we've got those layers done, then the design happens in two main places. It happens during backlog refinement as we break stories down, because as we try to break it down as a team, again, acting as a team, we're going to have to talk about how we think we're going to solve this. And so we're having a dialogue as opposed to writing a big document up. So sure. we're going to be talking about it. We're going to be thinking. We're going to be whiteboarding things, taking snapshots, attaching them to tickets, all that kind of stuff. And then when we get into sprint planning, that's when we get into detailed, low-level design. Again, bringing the team together and saying, how are we going to solve this? That's what design is all about, right? How are we going to solve this issue? The user wants to be able to do this with this kind of speed and accuracy and repetitively. How are we going to build that? Decision trade-offs, things like that. Things that right. you think about that you know will have ramifications downstream if you choose a certain path, certain way of doing something. And, 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 and what's actually really kind of ironic is that 
human beings think, I think, I've, I've come to the conclusion that human beings think naturally in terms of design. Mm -hmm. We don't think of abstract problems that we want to solve. We think, what am I going to build? So when you look at a client's ticket, and I, this is almost universal, when I look at their tickets, whatever their backlog is in JIRA, what I see is a whole bunch of design tickets, right? And these design tickets um, are full of build me this, build me that, build me this, build me that. And one of the things that they struggle with is that this is not a bad, these may not be bad design decisions. These are perfectly designed decisions, but they don't reflect the problem. So where do we put them? Right? I was having that with one client discussion just recently. It's like, here's some good design information. It doesn't belong in the acceptance criteria in a JIRA ticket because that's reserved for something else and that ain't it. So what do I put there? Where do you put this good design stuff? Mm -hmm. And no one has an answer because there isn't a JIRA ticket place for it. The right. attachment thing is kind of wonky. You can't see it very easily. You have to dig it out. It's really a pain in the butt. So where do you keep it? And we don't have, a, you know, this is one of the challenges. Say, well, you've got to figure out a way to place to keep this stuff. That's weird. You would think it would be part of, I mean, I, that would be something that some native tool supplier would probably come up with something like that, but it doesn't seem to be. But because prevalent. I don't, because I don't yeah. think it's the way human beings think. And yeah. so even the tool builders aren't thinking about problems and actual needs versus things we're going to build. They just think Tracking. features. Right. Right. Because right. it, it, it's, it's all messed up. That's a whole nother. We can go in that for an hour or so. I had a great time on yanking cool. on people's problems. So we have we have one more thing we hit. I think we got a little bit of time left here. I'm going to talk about one more topic today. And, and this may be relevant for startups and certainly relevant. We've seen it in, in many different teams. And that's the notion of the idea about staffing scrum rules. You know, in, in, in the perfect by-the-book scrum environment, you have a scrum master, you have a product owner. Um, but oftentimes in 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 New startups, you don't have those kinds of roles fully staffed, or you've got people doing part-time activities and things like that. Even in, we even see people who have been running Scrum for a long time say, "Well, yeah, we don't really have a product owner, right?" So, I mean, what do you do without a Scrum master, or what do you do without a product owner in those environments? What would you have? Would you put a preference on one versus the other if you're a startup with a with a limited staff? Which do, which were, which is more important to you in the early stages of Scrum? Um. So just as a sort of background to set this up, when I think of those three roles, product owner, scrum master, and development team, mm -hmm. I think it's good to think about the product owner works the business, the development team works the product, and the scrum master works the process. Mm -hmm. That said, product owner's main job is to feed the team work. Uh, super critical position, I would... Uh, well, people say, well, we don't have a product owner. They're still feeding the team work somehow, right? They've right. got maybe multiple people sort of blending together, fulfill that role. And chances are there's no one taking it seriously enough to do a really good job. And so garbage in, garbage out. Doesn't matter how great your process is. If you got crap coming in, you ain't going to have good stuff coming in. That transcends in. waterfall or scrum. That transcends waterfall <laughs> or scrum. It's been, and yep. <laughs> I love to tell the story because. It really is true. And I, ha I even made this little cartoon, had, well, I had it made for me, a little cartoon video that says the true origin of the product owner. Because I believe the true origin and the product owner was that development was always tasked with doing requirements. It was part of the software development cycle. First you do requirements, and we had a person on staff that was business analyst would go out and do requirements. And then we build the requirements, and then the user would get it and go, this sucks. <laughs> and it was, whose fault was it? Development, development. because they had the crappy, did the crappy job requirements. So early Scrum Guru <laughs> said, we keep getting burned here because requirements are really, 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 really hard. <laughs> Let's put that over on the business side, and we'll call it a product owner so like they want it or something, right? Because right. we don't want to own the product. They own the product, right? It's their job. And, and it was a brilliant move because when the requirements suck now, whose problem is it? It's their problem. You, the business, said build it's that. The, just like, it's we're the, just dumb yeah. developers. The single ringable neck right. thing. Right? Unfortunately, the business said, we don't know what this is. And they shoved it back in an IT department still have to staff it. <laughs> Uh, and then they get all the wrapped around this idea of the name product owner because product owners typically don't own squad. Right. They're typically grunts who are doing the business analysis and system analysis work that should be done if they have the skill set. Essential but critical role. So yeah. someone's feeding the teamwork. Are they doing a good job or not? That's what the product owner's job was, to make sure that job was being done well, being done correctly. They don't have that role. Work will still come in, but it's going to be garbage. Luckily, now with the incremental development, we'll learn quicker that it's garbage rather than eight months or a year that it's garbage. Maybe we can learn in a month or a month and a half that it's garbage and then make corrections. 
that are less cheaper to make than in a year and a half correction. So I really want that role. Development team, you're going to have a development team. That's not, doesn't seem to be an issue with that one at all, saying, well, we have a product owner and scrum master, but no development team. How do we do scrum? Right? I have not heard that one yet. <laughs> um, yeah, that scrum, makes sense. Scrum master, especially for my really small companies, the scrum master role, um, I actually encourage them to go out and get an external scrum master okay. um, because hopefully that person's not worried about burning bridges. Yeah. Because they got to look at the leadership phase, especially when they're doing this crappy job of feeding the team and saying, you're feeding them crap. You're feeding them a lot of garbage. And no, I don't care how good the process is, garbage in, garbage out. Right. And so they got to be able to stem and face that. And if they can use an internal employee for a scrum master, even though it kind of understands it, they're not going to be able to fight the political battles to help make that transition. And because scrum there is going to make every stupid little way they do business clear and sharp because there's nowhere to hide. Right. Scrum, and so if you had a messed up front end, you messed up uh, communication patterns, whatever is messed up in your organization, Scrum's going to say, here, look at this. And that's what the Scrum Master is there to fight. That said, just to run Scrum, I can run Scrum without Scrum Master. It's not that hard. Right. But Scrum Master is there to fight all those battles so they can actually run it when they get good stuff in so they can show good stuff coming out. Perfect. So I would, product owner is going to happen in some way. I think that's probably more important role. Scrum master, if you want to fight battles, I really want them there, but you can run without scrum. All my really mature scrum teams is like, yeah, we take turns because the facilitating of the stand up is like trivial. Right. That's nothing. Right. That's right. not the main job of a scrum master. Rotational is a good idea. That's good. To, and it's yeah. also good for the team thing because you, because you know, you're, your short straw is going to come up periodically, and you got to play that role. So you behave and don't don't badmouth the scrum master of the week. Right, and, and just and, and because you're mature enough, you've actually hopefully learned to start act as a team. And because and, and here's uh, something I love to say is, is if you're running scrum, in any of the scrum ceremonies or events or whatever you want to call them, if any of those feel like a meeting where you're just sharing information, you're doing it wrong. Right. Right? These are working sessions. And if you've gotten good at working sessions, you don't need a scrum master. You don't even need a rotational one because you know you're, we've got to get work done here. We've got the work done, and then we go out and work individually work, then we do group work, then we do individual work, and we have that back and forth. Right. So the growing the team thing is essential there as well. Right, right? because right. without it, then they, then all of those things turn into meetings. Absolutely. And I hear this. And we, we hate have meetings. too many meetings. We hate meetings. We hate Absolutely. meetings. All right. Yeah, so do Awesome. I. I think we're going to have to leave it right there. That's a great way to end that. Earl, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for coming to this meeting. This, yeah, <laughs> yeah you're, you're, you're dismissed. <laughs> we, we have so much more of your knowledge. Obviously, we have so much more of your knowledge to explore. So I want to invite you back to the mic again soon. So I assume maybe next time we do it in the afternoon, I can bring beer, it, you know. And maybe get you to talk more. You know, like, you be just more effusive. Have your time zone connection I know, correctly. I know. We should, it's, it's almost it's almost five o'clock in Belgium. So yeah. Okay. So that's all the time we have today. Be sure to tune in again for another edition of Inspect and Adapt, the Constructs Podcast. Until then, this has been Mark Griffin, your host. Liz Ostaszewski has been our audio engineer, and Devin Musgrave, our Invisible Man producer. Have a great next sprint. If you enjoyed this episode and you have comments or would like to talk with one of our practitioners, reach out via email using comments at constructs.com. Again, that's comments at constructs.com. We'd love to hear from you. 